Hey, my name is Alex Sulkin, writer of TED and Family Guy, and you're listening to The Anthony Rogers Show. Lucky you. You are now listening to the best show in the universe, The Anthony Rogers Show. You probably wish that this was your show, but it's not. It's The Anthony Rogers Show. Tell all of your friends to listen to this show. This show is possible because of sponsors like Siempre Tequila. Um, it's a good sipping tequila, good mixing for margaritas. Um, link in the description, buy some right now. Ola is a leading CBD brand within the health and lifestyle market. They focus their research on developing premium products for smart and demanding customers who seek to reshape their lives in a happy, healthy, and natural way. They offer a natural and effective aid for everyday life through selection of CBD products, CBD gummies, CBD tinctures, CBD soft gel, CBD warming salve. Welcome back to the greatest show in the entire universe. Uh, Today we have a huge guest. Um, I say pop culture icon, writer, producer. Uh, Some of his famous stuff has been like uh, Ted, uh, Family Guy, uh, a bunch of shit you've heard of. Google him. Uh, Alex Sulkin, how are you doing, man? I'm great. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. Dude, no problem. Thanks for uh, going backwards and doing this show. I think, I think this is beneath you probably. Like, no. no. If, if you knew me personally, you'd know nothing is beneath me. And uh, I, will, I will come where I'm asked. That's, not, that's, <laughs> not, that's how I am. I think that's how you get successful, honestly, is like just being able to be open to like, all ideas, you know? Sure. Yeah. No, and, and also, man, I mean, I just, just checking out your profile, I was so intrigued. Like you just, you, you have a very cool look. And I was like, I got to talk to this guy. <laughs> Flattery will get you everywhere, brother. It'll get you yeah. everywhere. <laughs> so you've done some like crazy things. Like, uh, I mean, I'd say like, uh, like family guys, probably the one that stuck out the most to me, but that's not, I mean, it depends on how you perceive the world and how, what, what people like as entertainment, I guess. But, but that's like an amazing accomplishment. You were a producer and writer for that show. That's right. And, and when people say producer and writer, I mean, that basically just means writer. Um, produ- producer is just a tag that they put on you if you've been somewhere long enough. And so then they say, this year you're a consulting producer or you're an executive producer, but it's all just different terms for, for being a writer. Um, so as far as producing, we have a great production team that handles all the animation, sound, all that shit. And we just look at the jokes. Yeah, producer means friend with or, with the uh, the owner or director, right? Like that's what. Pr- yeah. yeah, always, <laughs> always. But, but writer, I mean, that's that's still impressive. That was a, that was. A, I mean, that show's hilarious, man. Like that's a that's a really funny show and it's really big, you know. And um, I, I congrats on the success of that, dude. That's like crazy. Yeah, you know, it's thank you. Um, it's a great place to work. I feel incredibly lucky to have been there because if you know you know, Hollywood writers or TV writers, movie writers, it's so rare uh, that you can get a a job where you can be in one place for 17 years, which is basically what it's been now. Because most shows just come and go. And if, if if you have a show that's on the air for five years, that's like a huge success. So I think the fact that it's animation and, you know, so the cast doesn't necessarily grow old, um, it's it's just been a great spot and i'm thankful to you know to seth mcfarland for hiring me and and i, I just love being there that's awesome it's a very humble way to look at it man and yeah i think cartoons if they if they have the way if they can hit i mean they have the way of saying timeless because nothing ages or anything like that so i mean so i mean that's that's the move i think if you can get it i mean it's hard to get a successful show at all like you said some people celebrate pilots you mean like, <laughs> like yeah you know, like, it just depends on like the scenario and the, and, uh, the situation it's a tough industry to get into but i mean you just throw enough stuff at the wall you find i mean you find out what sticks i guess or whatever shitty totally. metaphor. and that's that you're 100 percent right like to get a show to get a pilot made of a show, you've already had to clear so many hurdles. <laughs> and like that is a large accomplishment. So just the, the, the almost 20 years on, on air is, is insane. No, oh, it is. That's a, that's, that's a long time, man. Yeah. And like, it's cool too, because you almost became like, I'd say with Twitter, you almost became like a pop culture icon outside of, uh, outside of writing for entertainment or something like that. You almost became like a, I mean, you did become a personality off of Twitter that a lot of people may not have even known where you came from before that almost, you know? Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I, boy, I loved, um, like many people, Twitter at the beginning was so fun. 
Yeah. Um, you know, it's turned into something that's kind of a hellscape now, but, uh, you know, it would, in the beginning, it was just really fun because there were, you know, fewer people on there. Everybody kind of wanted to have fun and, uh, it, it, it was great. It was, it was very well suited to my comedic style, which is lazy. Like I don't like to write a lot. So Twitter doesn't let you write a lot. And I'm like, I'm here for this. That's hilarious. That's a, no, I think most entertainment people are like that. It's like the easiest way to get money. And like, um, I don't know. Like, I, I feel like if, if something else paid better, we'd probably be in some of their field, you know, not, not that I'm comparing family guy to this podcast, but it was loosely veiled under entertainment. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> we'd be at the same picnic. That's, yeah, it's just like the, we, we find like the, the smart people will find the laziest way to monetize, like, like no matter what. Whole, totally, totally. <laughs> Podcast is a great example. Like you get oh, to, yeah. <laughs> you can sit at home and say, let's do it at this time, you know? No, yeah, it's a perfect job for me. I could, do any, I could talk to people like that shouldn't even be talking to me, you know, all the time. No, so, you, you, got a, you got a great style. I, can, I already can tell you. You have an instant analytical style. Have you noticed this? I'm sure you have about yourself. Like you... I've already noticed in like the first few questions, when I tell you something, you instantly process that and have a very genuine reaction to it and then move on to the next thing, which I think is a very cool style because oh, oftentimes you. when guests are answering, I've noticed this being a guest on a podcast, like you can already see that the other person is just kind of thinking of the next question. Well, so, you make a lot of people nervous in your interviews, I've noticed. I was watching your interviews and like, you'll be just like talking like a normal person and they're like, oh yeah, so like, what's it like to do stuff? I, I, you, you intimidate people with your success, I think. And, that, and that's what I've seen in a lot of your podcasts. Like I was oh watching. God. That's ridiculous. Again, if you knew me personally, that's insane. <laughs> I don't think, I can't tell, tell me the secret of intimidating my wife. I can't seem to do it. She rolls over me. <laughs> I can't think of a smart enough a ass answer for that. I don't know, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but no, <it's, laughs> that's crazy. That's crazy though, man, that, um, like you've done a lot of cool stuff. I think a lot of like, uh, your sense of humor really works. I think with people like really well, I think, was that like a thing you, like you developed or was it kind of natural or like, um, yeah, I, again, um, the main, the main thing you're looking at here is luck and then like a sub subset of lazy. So it's like, <laughs> because I've been rewarded for my lazy style, like this whole time, you somehow through some miracle, like it's, it's tricked enough people along the way to say like, Hey, that's funny. This guy's funny. Uh, so I just keep doing that. Like I'm, you're not, I wouldn't look for any like 700 page tome from me about my time in Hollywood. You're just going to get tweets until you get a gravestone. It's probably your authenticity then, man. Like, I think, like, if uh, people can connect to real people faster. And I think uh, a lot of people in, like, entertainment or in most industries just play pretend and stuff. Like, you, like they'll, they'll have some, like, deep fake answer using big words they think only smart people use and stuff. And, right. and like, and you, and you seem like you're just to the point. You're like, no, I mean, I mean, you probably work your ass off. But, I mean, there's a lot of luck that comes with working your ass off, though, too. I can see that, you know? Yeah, there, there's always luck along the way. But, you know, for so many people like Seth had to, to have a luck to get family guy on the air and he had to have even more luck to have it come back that was on crazy, the yeah. air after being canceled. And I was lucky to have met him on a different job. Lucky that he was again, charmed by my little dances and puns, you know, like my <laughs> little, my little dance monkey writer stuff somehow worked on him. And uh, now he's uh, you know, he's been paying me off ever since. <laughs> so uh, now, now it's just keep your head down until you hit that retirement number and then I can uh, nap and watch the love boat all day. <laughs> That's hilarious, man. So did you, uh, did you meet him by auditioning or was this a uh, friend prior or like what? Uh... No, actually I was, uh, again, a, a stroke of luck. I was working on my first ever uh, sitcom. So I started on, on the late, late show with Craig Kilborn. That's right. I read that. Okay. Yeah. Right. So I was there for three years, decided I kind of want to go into sitcoms because honestly, you can just make more money in sitcoms than you can in late night. And uh, the first show I ever got on was this show called The Pits, which was briefly on Fox, less than a season. Um, so people didn't love the show, but the writer's room on that show was fantastic. Just all wow. these people who had worked on The Simpsons wow. and, and Seinfeld, like just, I was, it was mind blowing to me. So um, one of the people in the room was Seth MacFarlane because it was at a period when Family Guy had been pulled off the air by Fox, but Fox still had him under 
contract. So they said, well, you know, you're not doing your show, but we still want you to work for money. Um, so here, go on this show. And the show again was The Pits. And Seth and I are roughly the same age. We're like within a year of each other. And so we just bonded in that room. Um, just had a lot of laughs in that room and it carried over to like, we would go out to, uh, and like do karaoke together, like get uh -huh. hammered all over LA. And uh, one night he just said, you know, they're talking about bringing family guy back. And if they do, I'd like you to come work there. And I was thinking, well, sure, but there's no way they're going to do that. Um, but then of course they did. And, and I was there. So, and have been there since. Yeah, I think that almost added to the buildup is when I went away and came back. I think it like added uh, to to the marketing and like uh, like a uh, folklore, I guess, of the song of the show. You know, absolutely. It's like getting thrown out of a Roman city and then coming back as like a conqueror. You know, two years <laughs> later with the you know sort of all these heads on spikes. You know, it, it was great. It felt like when they brought it back, you just kind of felt like okay. They've admitted weirdly that they were wrong to pull it off. So now they're not going to say they're wrong again and cancel it. it. It was a great feeling. For sure. I, I say it's almost like radio DJs made, made their career like in the 80s and 90s was just getting fired. It was like the best promotion ever, apparently. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's interesting. I never thought about it that way. I guess it really worked for Stern, huh? Yeah, yeah, Stern, and then there's a bunch of like other ones that kind of have that same format. He's the most successful for sure. Right. But um, that's that's weird. So do you um, I, I I wonder if this happens. Do you, do you do you run into people that haven't heard of Family Guy or like the things you've worked on? Yeah, all the time. I had a all feeling. Time. <laughs> yeah, it's it's as I mean, especially like now. I've been living in on Cape Cod in Massachusetts for uh, the last year, and I grew up around Boston, so. But people here don't know any of that shit. Like, you know, it's like <laughs> some of the younger kids do. But I'm walking around at like, you know, restaurants on the water with waspy people and pink pants and stuff and being introduced to people. And they're like, what do you do? Writer. For what? Uh, it's a show called Family Guy. Oh, no, I don't. You know, they don't know. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, I I always say it's funny when people don't know like huge shows. Like, yeah, like I, I had a guy from Impractical, or a producer from Impractical Jokers, and he told me he lived in New York and no one heard of his show. Like, yeah. I guess it's, I guess it's only popular in the Midwest or something. And I was just wondering how that, if that it was like Family Guy's a way bigger show probably than most shows. That's like crazy that people wouldn't hear of it to me, but I had a feeling it happened. I don't know why. Yeah, yeah, it does all the time, <laughs> and and uh, I, it seems totally legit. Like, I don't think anybody is pretending not to know Family. Yeah, I think it's not a very Cape Cod thing. It's an LA thing. Yeah, I think they just, they just, right, to pretend to not know something is very LA. But I think the people here, they just live in a different kind of world, you know, like some of them, they just miss all that shit. They're like, I'm not going to watch a fucking cartoon. Like, I'm not watching anything. Like, I'm an adult. I, you know, I don't, I don't do that. Yeah, and there's so many people that like uh, that that pose as being entertainers that like uh, like like I have the same problem when I when I tell people I do comedy or something. They're like, "Oh, really?" Like they think I'm like just in my garage getting drunk playing guitar, pretending I'm Kurt Cobain or something. Like the, sa the same way I, I imagine when you say you're a writer, most people have heard like all their like loser friends pretend to be writers and like they're oh yeah, you like live at home, that's cool, you know? Like <laughs> like because <Right. laughs> there's not that many successful examples of entertainers that people meet in daily life. So the, so the most examples they get are like the people that pretend to be the fake it till you make it people kind of you know. Totally, totally. And there and there's definitely like there I think it's almost proven over time that fake it till you make it is kind of a good way to it's it, it's a way to go. You know, like if you are committed to being a writer or an entertainer of some kind, and even if nobody's heard of you, if you kind of like project that image, maybe you'll get there. Maybe it gives you a ten percent better chance of getting there. I don't know. Yeah, I could probably, never. I could never do that. I would be mortified. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I think I think in limits growth it makes you think you're already there a lot of times too. And like, like, uh, like you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm this, but like, no, you should be like, I'm like trying to be this. You know, I don't know how to describe yeah. it. I can see it going both ways, man. A lot of people get caught in their delusion is the only problem I see. Totally, totally right. Yeah, I can, I can see both sides. Like, I, I just say that as a person who, in general, has lacked that sort of easy <laughs> confidence about yeah. myself. So I, whenever I hear of people being that way, I'm sort of like, I would never do that, but I kind of am jealous of someone who can do that. Yeah. yeah. I, f I feel like it's like a 19 year old's game or something, you know, just like, you're like, I'm fucking awesome. Did you know that? Do you yeah. know how fucking awesome I am? You know, it's like, but then like, yeah, like you have to put in the 10 years work or however long like, you put yeah. in, I'm, like you got to put in a lot of work to get where you're going, you know, like, did you write on, were you like always like, I'm going to be a writer or like, was this like a thing that just kind of came naturally or? Yeah. I think like a lot of writers, I'm kind of a frustrated performer. 
Um, I definitely in high school, you know, I was big into being in like high school musicals and plays. Like I really enjoyed that. And I think that I thought that I would do something like that. Like, I don't know exactly. I can't say like acting in a movie, but more like, uh, you know, being like a daily show correspondent or something like so you'd be that, a lot better Trevor Noah, probably just that, that kind of route, um, which is, I think directly responsible for me, like not enjoying John Stewart, because I think I'm so jealous every time I see him, I'm like, this guy is better than me at everything I ever wanted to do. So like whenever <laughs> I watch him, I'm like, I'm, I'm like Salieri watching Mozart and all the papers are falling everywhere. Um, you guys are like the same guy. Like when you said Daily Show, I almost linked that in my head. That's probably because I don't like a lot of people like myself either. I get competitive with them. And that's probably what you do. You're like, you guys are very similar, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that you do that. There's a, uh, somebody wrote a book and I, I always think of it and I can never remember who it was or whatever. But this guy wrote a whole book because he grew up at the same time as that football, old football legend, Frank Gifford. Okay. So Frank Gifford was a huge football star in like the 50s, 60s. And then he became a successful announcer at Monday Night Football. And this guy was like a classmate of his early on. And so this guy who's writing the book for every little accomplishment in his life, Frank Gifford would like win the Super Bowl, you know, like uh -huh. become an all-star. Like it, uh -huh. so he just compared his life to Frank Gifford, like that's all the way so through. Funny. And so I think that's kind of what people like us do. You're always looking at somebody who's like doing better than you are. And you're just like, er, why does that guy have that stuff? Yeah, I heard about like one of the sound park creators, the guy, the guy at the fro. He he would be like, um, like when he first moved to LA, he'd be like in a shitty car in the passenger seat, uh, making fun of all the people on their cell phones and BMWs. And then like I heard he became that guy later. <laughs> like, I'm sure, I'm sure <laughs> it's it's hard not to. Um, I definitely, you know, you, you see that a lot where just suddenly, uh, you know, you're working for someone or with someone who's like got a massage appointment or having his hair dyed or, you know, going to a tanning salon, you know, it just all becomes very weird in LA. No, I, yeah. LA is a weird thing. Yeah, for sure. It's got, its, it's got its ups, I guess. But uh, so have you ever tried stand-up comedy? Yes. You so, kill at that, that, I feel like. Well, no. Cause again, remember the, remember the byline of my newspaper, which is lazy. So <laughs> it is a I, lot did, of work. I did stand up um in the in the late 90s from like 90 mid 90s 96 to like 99 2000 that makes um, a lot of sense actually yeah and i enjoyed it and i have so many like hilarious memories from it but it was all like i was in some kind of like spinal tap you know <laughs> documentary about stand up comedy it was like i was on the lowest rung a friend a good friend of mine says the day, because we started around the same time in 96, and he was like, the day we started comedy was the day after the comedy boom ended. Like, we, <laughs> we got into it at this time when suddenly the market was oversaturated. You know, it was really hard to get stand-up. I did it in New York. Um, but, I, you know, I had a great time. But I never had the energy or enthusiasm to commit to writing all day, to commit to having an energy on stage or like a character. And I'm not talking about like Jeff Foxworthy kind of character, <laughs> like just a stage persona, just any kind of charisma on stage. Like I always tried to undersell it, you know, and I'm, I'm not Stephen Wright. Like he can do that. Oh, wow. Yeah. To me, great. it just comes up, you know, to anyone else, it just comes off as like, here's another white Jewish guy reading jokes from his notebook. <laughs> I would say, I would say, don't build a persona and just like um, ad lib. Like you seem like a dude who could just bullshit anybody, like uh, like type thing. You know, like uh, I tw like I think that's the key, really. Because like, right, oh, I watch all these people write jokes and like um, and like they don't know who the fuck they're gonna talk to that night. You know, it's like, it's yeah. like you have the best joke in the world to like this audience, but like this audience doesn't give a fuck, and then you prepared for the wrong thing. Like you know, exactly. I see exactly. a lot of that. It's like Mike Tyson. You know, said uh, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Well, and yeah, exactly. It's just like when you get up there doing stand up and the first thing goes wrong, that's when you instantly have to like, am I going to recover <laughs> or am I just going to plow through like as a beaten man? I think a lot of the recoveries are the best parts of jokes too. Like, like if I'll tell a joke and it bombs, like I, it's more fun coming up with the recovery. Like yeah. almost like, I feel like, uh, I don't know. Stand up's a fun thing. I, I can see you killing it that, but like, but yeah, no, I can see like how like you wouldn't want to do it. Like touring seems awful at this point in life. 
it just seems like I'm, I'm, I'm like 30 something and like am I, 20 something that was like the dream like 24 i'd be yeah. like oh wow i could just travel and like fucking live in hotels and now, now i'm like i'm like i'm about as almost as lazy as you are now these days i just don't want to leave my house even really i not has nothing to do with the pandemic i just don't want to you know it's like right Right. Yeah. My wife tells me that the pandemic altered my life. Not at all. Like I just <laughs> now it's just now we don't have to get into an argument about going out to dinner or not. It's like, we can't. Sorry. Guess yeah, we're gave, staying home again. It gave you an excuse without having kids. You know, all, all my friends are like, oh, I have kids. I can't do that. And I don't have an excuse. And I'm like, oh, no, the world's ending. I can't fucking yeah. eat ravioli right now. <laughs> well, I, I do have one kid. So we oh, still you have that. You have double excuse now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Oh, so the world is burning. That's fun, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. I thought Terrible. it would suck more. I thought it would suck more. You know, the, the end of the world. I thought it'd be more terrifying. No, it, it it happens like in dribs and drabs, right? So <laughs> it just feels like it's happening now. Muscles are cooking on the beach and in, in Canada. I'm sure you saw that highest yeah. highest temperature ever recorded in Death Valley the other day. It's crazy. I think we're going into the sun. I think the Earth's uh, mass uh, is lower than the sun. I think we're just going into the sun, honestly. Awesome. I love hearing new terrifying theories. <laughs> <laughs> they, look, they would look at planets like uh like the, they thought we were the only like um like universe like galaxy thing out there. And then they found out like um planets were like they call them exoplanets are basically up against the sun or ball of gas that they're the star, I guess, uh, up against it. So there's like a bunch of planets up against stars already, or what we would call planets, like right. And, and I feel like that's the I mean it makes sense. Like, I mean that's a ball of gas. So they, like ultimately all the planets in our solar system will kind of be tightly around the sun and then it will kind of explode i don't know i'm not sure about the explosion yet it might though i don't know but i, I definitely think that we're going getting sucked into it just how mass works you know we're like we're, oh, yeah if we if we move you know 50 yards closer to the sun i think doesn't that like end all life on earth yeah like, yeah it's a very precise thing yeah and we, we're almost between the ice age and burning up it seems like <laughs> god from my perspective i don't know but i mean I, I don't know there's enough other terrifying things in the world to focus on i guess but I, I, <laughs> so many yeah <laughs> so many, <laughs> so many. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's funny seeing like um I don't know. There's a lot of silver lining in the pandemic to me personally because like uh it's funny just seeing how fucking stupid people are <laughs> like uh, on, on like every side of an argument. And I'm like, I don't even have a side. I feel like, but it, but it's just like uh like I I remember just like going to the get like uh just some store and everybody's just dressed in, like the, I'm like in St. Louis City. And people were wearing like trash bag hazmat suits and shit. Like 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 their skin not breathing is gonna save them. Like it's just right. so it's just so fucking weird. Like I I don't know, man. Like I feel yeah. like. It was a, it was a, what a crazy beginning. I remember, and we, we were in that stage, you know, because I felt like nobody knew what was going on, and I wouldn't wear garbage bags to the to the to the grocery store. You'd go through and you'd get out of there kind of faster. I would say that that would be my, <laughs> that's true. I was kind of just moving a through the aisles faster, and um, but I remember getting home and we were like Cloroxing off the the groceries, you know, you take the groceries out and you'd be like, better wipe all this bag of rice down, you know? And we just didn't know, you know, the first few weeks you're like, you don't want to give your kid some disease you don't know about, but there, there's like a, there's a middle ground where when you start putting trash bags on you, that's when my mind makes a decision. Like I'd rather just die from something than have to do that. <laughs> That's kind of how I felt, and I didn't even really try, and I'm still alive. I could, I got, I, I got, I, I, I feel like everyone else tried a lot harder than I did to, yeah. to uh, be, be alive here still. And it was just, it was a weird thing. And yeah, you're right, you didn't know at the beginning. And like fear does shrink, like logic, I guess, to where like, to where, yeah, people, my friends were like just putting stuff on their hands every five minutes. Their hands were swelling, and, I, and I'm just like, I'm like, the things you're doing to save yourself are affecting you more than the virus. Right, right. <laughs> it's Your so fucking. It's gonna be like tissue paper after all of this with the hand sanitizers and softeners and. Uh, what, where, so did you grow up in st louis if you don't I, mind me asking you a question no you're good <laughs> no yeah. you're good it's, it's uh your interview now uh i'm <laughs> i was fucking around no i i grew up in the suburbs of st louis like o'fallon missouri technically okay because you uh, i just listening to you you have like there's this incredible through line of intelligence the way you talk so i'm, I'm just curious about were you uh like a, a, a student in public school who just excelled or someone who didn't excel because you were like, fuck these people? Or did you go to a private school and you were like academic minded? What, what, what is your background? Uh, my, pa my parents were smart and like, um, and I was like, I, I relate a lot to your lazy comment tour. Yeah, no school. I didn't do too well at all. I barely, I mean, I kind of just was really into smoking weed and like blonde girls and like, sure. uh, like it, more so than like memorizing 1980s, like fucking school in two thousands, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then the That's internet, 
I probably the internet. I'd probably be a dumbass factory worker. I mean, I mean, I'm not saying all factory workers are dumb, but I'd be I'd be a dumbass factory worker voting for the right. internet probably. That's so interesting. And by the way, you and I have to uh, agree to disagree because I was always brunettes, but I appreciate blondes. <laughs> uh, but brunettes were my jam. I didn't so, mean to offend you. I didn't mean no, to. No, uh... no offense taken. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I'm, I'm just fucking around it. But uh, that's yeah. No, it's um. I don't know. How to, I think the internet made us all intelligent, really, because like uh, the. But we just wouldn't have had that much access to information without the internet, probably. I think it's being yeah. limited now. Like well, you yeah, I think you seem like you're probably better at procuring the right information than a lot of people because you just have a, again, there's like a, a spine of intelligence going through the way you communicate, which is so slightly unusual because you have this long beard and these glasses <laughs> and you, you talk a little faster, I would say, than most people, but it's got an absolute spine of truth to it which i rarely hear so i appreciate that you're like is this what authenticity is like other than the, other than your appearance <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> that's hilarious man no uh, i appreciate that no i do talk fast and it's funny because only smart people can even really understand what i'm saying it's like a lot, <laughs> a lot, a lot of slow people just like what like they'll say you talk fast and that they don't have anything else to say other than you talk fast so right. i can tell they didn't really hear anything yeah they didn't hear well <laughs> yeah i hear it that's what, yeah, no, I can, I can tell people's processing, yeah. And like, uh, no, it's, uh, I don't know, I think, like I said, I think it's the internet that made uh, enough people smart to where, like, I mean, you, I guess you had your choice. And then you brought up a good point about Twitter, man, because Twitter used to be really fun. And, like, um, I'm not even allowed to use Twitter now. Like, I tried to, they, they, they suspended my verified account, and then I, I, I tried to make another one. And they're like, no, you can't, basically. I guess they have my device or I, I or something, I don't know. Wow. So was, and were they getting weird complaints about you, or was it just yeah, like... A yeah. I was just I was just running my mouth for fun and they, they just get pissed off. It was yeah. not, nothing too crazy, but I was I was I was just calling people with fucking names. That I thought it was funny. Yeah, but yeah, that could be funny. It used to be funny. Can't really do that anymore. This episode is sponsored by Dr. Hemp. Go to Dr. Hemp Supply. It's Dr. Uh, Hemp Supply dot com. You get some palm pre rolls. It's CBD and CBG. You have a. Uh, Mint flavors, banana flavors, berry flavors, watermelon, pine. Just try them all. Go to drhempsupply.com. Use promo code Best Show. This episode is brought to you by Cream City Vapes. Go to creamcityvapes.com. A link in the description. Uh, get butane and torches, carb caps and pearls, dab dumpster, dab tools, mood mats, temp readers. Free shipping or fifty dollars, and they plant one tree per product sold. Well, right. yeah, you have to apologize for being funny now. Like, if you tell right. a really, really, really good joke, you have to apologize afterwards or it's not a joke anymore. I know. Like, it's crazy. And so you're doing stand-up now or, have you, or lately these past – did you do it or are you still continue to do it? I haven't done it in a second. Um, um, I'm not sure if this is the pandemic or just me when not to do podcasts or easier, you know? <laughs> totally. I agree. The minute I, could, the minute I could turn my back on stand up, I did instantly. It was like, once I got a job as a writer, I was like, never again, stand up, but good luck to you. Keep going. I love the fear aspect of it. Cause I'd be like, I get nervous every time still. And, and I love that aspect of it. Like the challenge of like, um, of like, I don't know, more or less like conquering a crowd. Because you don't know what these people want to fucking hear. You don't know anything about them. And like, uh, I like the concept of like that, you know? Yeah. No, I know. Well, I mean, God, when I used to do it in New York, I did it at a, all the time on the weekends at this place right off of Times Square. And it was just a, an absolute shithole. Like it was in the <laughs> back of a terrible restaurant. So you had to like go through this weird obstacle course even to find the comedy thing. And it would inevitably be, you know, 10 to 12 uh, tourists from either out of town or out of country who we had handed flyers to in Times Square over the previous three hours. And they come into this, these poor people come into this terrible place <laughs> with either people like me just starting who were nobodies or the strange like half dead locals that were, you know, still going there year after year after year. Um, and it, it was terrifying. And you know, like you said, you never knew what you were going to get when you stepped on stage. You didn't know, like, are these, is this table of six making a lot of noise? Are they from Germany? Are they from Houston, Texas? Are they, you know, cause they're not from New York. Like what, so what am I going to be telling jokes about tonight? Yeah, what's relative to your audience if you don't know they're, where they're from or anything about them? It's crazy. Yeah. It's like, uh, I, I had to sit in front of a bunch of French people one time, like, uh, like 
and like actually from France, like speaking French and like, uh, and like in Bolinas, California, I think that was the weirdest fucking set I've ever done. I think one of them, at least it like, was 1800s, like tavern called like smiley saloon or, or some shit like that. Yeah. And, like, and like this beautiful town, but like nobody fucking spoke English other than the bartender. I felt like, and like, uh, I, that's the, that's hard mode. Cause I'm a fucking idiot. I don't know any other language. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> it almost like, like, what do you do? Turn into a fucking mime? You know, it's like, I, you're, that's about the only way you can get, get, get them. I guess. I don't know. Slash know. comedy maybe. It's funny. I I, uh, I used to actually have a, a joke in my stand up about that about French, where I said, you know, I took uh, seven years of French in high school and college, and that means uh, when I hear two people speaking a foreign language on the subway, I can tell you whether or not it's French. <laughs> that's that's all I got out of the whole thing. Like I I could barely say hello. Yeah, there's no, I mean, in English is the money language. There's no real uh, inspiration for me to learn another language. I mean, I, know. I mean, I don't have to like learn anything. I don't have to do anything to survive really. It's like a water faucet, you know, like some pretty dumb. I mean, <laughs> I would be smarter in like the 1800s if I had to speak other languages maybe or something. You know? right. There's no like, I mean, survival is really easy right now. I know, especially with the Google Translate too. Oh yeah. You talk to anybody online and make them think you know things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, um, what are you working on uh, currently? Like, well, well I'm interview. still on Family Guy, and uh, I um, have been working on a, uh, another uh, movie with Seth. We're actually doing a reboot of uh, Naked Gun. What so, the fuck? That's yeah. going to kill. So, well, we hope so. I mean, it's, uh, it's taking a while to get the goddamn script written, but again, very lazy. And uh, it, it, it could be awesome. It's going to be starring Liam Neeson, so as for, as the Frank Drebin role, which is pretty exciting. Is Liam Neeson um, still alive? Uh, I hope so. What the no, fuck? You're thinking, of, you're thinking of Leslie Nielsen. Leslie Nielsen, yeah, you're right. Liam Neeson's the, the action guy or whatever? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Holy shit, okay, yeah. That makes more sense. <laughs> it's funny that they're both LN and their names are very similar and they may end up playing that same role, but... Um, that is yeah, so I've been working on that. I'm, I'm actually uh, doing a podcast with a buddy of mine. It hasn't, it hasn't launched yet, but we've, we've recorded like eight of them. Um, so I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, as you know, how fun they can be and how easy it is to be kind of sitting at home. <laughs> don't tell uh, them the secret that it's easy. But, but yeah. Yeah, <laughs> don't tell them the secret. But no, so back to, sorry to interrupt, but back to Naked Gun, that, that could pop off a lot. That could be huge, honestly. That's interesting. Well, yeah, I mean... Listen, we hope we want the worst thing. The worst version of it is like it's a pale uh, imitation of the originals. Like you don't because those movies are so beloved by comedy people, especially. Oh, sure. um, so you don't want to fuck it up. And I think <clears throat> that's why it's been taking us a while to write the script, because we just want it to be hilarious all the way through. And you can't really settle for anything else when you're when you're going at the one of the giants like naked gun so we you know we're, we're trying to get it right and I'm, I'm sure we will and i hope it does well but who knows what a movie release will even be at that point you know will it will it be this sort of strange you know sent to 45 theaters and premiering on hbo max like who knows yeah we're in the wild west again for film yeah it's weird. I mean, it's a good time. He's like, oh, half of them are going down as being pedophile. So there's less competition right now. <laughs> <laughs> like, you don't have to blow Harvey Weinstein to get a job anymore, apparently. So, uh, like, you can you yeah. do it for fun still, but you don't, you don't have to do it to get, to get hired. Correct. Which is good, right? Yeah, they, they changed the rules. <laughs> they changed the rules. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. hilarious. No, I mean, yeah, you definitely have to reinvent uh, entertainment over and over again. I think, I mean, por- porn's a great example of how, like, because I was free completely forever with porn. I mean, it still is to a degree, but you're seeing, like, OnlyFans start to monetize it. And, like, uh, and porn kind of always leads the way of monetizing entertainment almost. Like, I feel like it led the way of the internet with credit card payments, and um, it kind of leads the way. And then, like, I think, like, music, it, music, you have people going platinum. In 2016, you have people going platinum again. I'm like, what? That didn't happen for 20 years. I and know. then, like, and now with film, I mean, yeah, you're, you're right. They're all going to, like, HBO Max and other things. Like, HBO truly is the home box office now. It's like, it's fucking, it's a weird time. And I think, like, you're in a weird in-between spot where, I mean, you're probably, are, if you're on a big TV show, you probably don't have to worry about budget, but I, but I feel like there's going to be a lot more money in entertainment soon, especially in film and stuff. That's what it seems like. Wow. I, I, and I, I trust you, like, because everything you just said was correct. And I never thought about that HBO thing. They are really the home box office now. Yeah, that was their aspirations. You know? I, just, I just wish they hadn't fucking shoved that 
Wonder Woman 84 turd down our throats at the beginning of this pandemic. I was very disappointed. Bro, I haven't been able to watch a comic book movie in 20 years, man. Like, that shit is so watered down. It is so bad to me, to me personally. It's yeah, like, well, what, what kind of... Do, so were you into, like, Spawn and Blade and that kind of stuff? or what? what I mean, that shit's still cool, but I just feel like, like... And I don't even hate comic book movies. I just feel like it's overdone and played out. It's like, right. it's like the same thing. Like, the news just plays a school shooting every day. Every, every, every movie's a Marvel movie, and I'm just like, can I have something fucking new or original? Or maybe... I, I, I don't know. Let's just yeah. the same shit over well, and over again. Over. That's interesting. Again, this is this is our blondes brunettes of entertainment because I when I saw Infinity War in the theater, it was like one of the five greatest theater going experiences I've ever had. Well, that's why they make them. I mean, people fucking yeah. buy them. I mean, you know, yeah. like otherwise they wouldn't be doing it if it didn't make money. Totally. So I mean, people yeah. relate to what you're saying. I, I'm just saying my personal experience is like I just I, I don't know. I, I don't even hate comic books. I say that every movie's a comic book movie. Right. And okay. so did you feel that way about like Dark Knight? Or did you like, did you think that was okay? I, yeah, I didn't, I didn't really, I didn't really want, I watched a little bit of it and just left kind of, it was just kind of a, I don't, I don't know how to describe it. It wasn't my, I don't know. I try really, really hard because I'm a big right. fan of movies, but like, it's like uh, in the late sixties, whenever they kept making like Westerns over and over again, that's yeah. kind of what I feel like right now. It's just like, they're, like it's like, I'm sure some of it's good, but there's 90% of it's such garbage. It, it makes me hard, hard to enjoy a film like Dark Knight or even, even if like a, a movie, I haven't even seen Infinity Wars because of like all the other shit that's in the way. You know what I mean? I feel right. like, so I may be missing the good films or something because of the oversaturation yeah. of the market. No, I think you just, you missed like a few awesome moments in the midst of like, you know, 20 movies that could have been like three. Yeah. There's um, so a bunch but, of business plans versus movies, you know, they're like yeah, they're all business yeah. plans. What do you what do you think of a a movie like uh, uh, Interstellar? Did you enjoy that? Loved it. Loved that movie. Yeah, yeah. that was, that was a great my, movie. That's one of my favorites. No, it's a client. Well, then I, I should have told you I didn't like it just to mess with you. But <laughs> <laughs> if, you had, if you had known, then you could have done that. Yeah, hindsight. But no, yeah, I mean, there's still some great stuff happening. I mean, I, I like to, I mean, and plus we're in a generation where like the first like 15 minutes aren't captivating. We have like 4,000 other movies that are disposable. So it's like, I, I wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been like that in the 90s. I like remember just putting it, like as a kid, I just put in a VHS and I maybe had five more at the time, you know, or my parents had more, but I'm just saying like, I maybe had like five fucking movies to choose from, you know? Totally. Yeah, I remember going to college with just like four or five VHS tapes. Like, one, you know, a couple of them had like four episodes of The Simpsons on them. And I was just <laughs> like, let's go. That's crazy that you, you were into The Simpsons too. Like, I feel like Family Guy is like the, the next generation's like kind of thing. Like, like you know, it's like, uh, like, like a version of The Simpsons, I think, you know? Yeah, of course. Uh, absolutely it is. You know, I mean, <clears throat> Family Guy wouldn't be what it is without the Simpsons, which is, I mean, the, the original Simpsons was such a revelation when it came on. It was like, I'm sure to watch them now, they would seem pretty slow paced and, and kind of tame. But at the time it was like, it had all the right people up in arms, you know, the parent teacher council and some, you know, Christian administration saying, we got to cancel the Simpsons and get it off. Then what are we watching? But now you look at it, it's like, it's just great old classic television. It's crazy. Well, yeah, that's probably about closer to how people are like, um, like how like, um, I love Lucy was in the fifties, like a representation of the time kind of, it's, it's like, um, you have, and I, and I don't know if like, um, I don't know if the hot girl and like fat oaf kind of idiot guy is like, is like a represent is a, is a mirror of society or, or like it's, or people are mimicking it because it's been on television. Like, I don't know which way it went. Like, I, like to be I think honest, it's the chicken and the egg, I think it started the, the way you said, like as a mirror of society, like an aspirational uh, kind of thing for white men of course you know like this is what this is what the dream is and you can be Jackie Gleason and here's your attractive wife and uh, then it just happened over and over again because like you say other tv shows said well that worked let's let's yeah. imi let's imitate it let's do that yeah, the fat. Oh, I, also, I think like men don't want people bet, like smarter than them, or like, like they're very. We're, like, like a lot, a lot of them are very competitive. Where they don't want like it's like Ron Jeremy was successful because he was overweight. Like I mean, like in porn, basically. Like, right. like, and I think that says everything about like like we don't, we don't want to see somebody that we think we're not better than as a man almost. That's true. That's like, a good point. That's a good point. And also, I just can't see sadly, and and this will probably happen. I'm sure going forward. But sadly, I could not see that the other way around, where it's like handsome guy and slob woman. You know, it, it would be, <laughs> I, I just don't see, like America is, we are sadly not ready for that, I don't think. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, I, it, either way, it's weird. I feel like it's just like, it's just a weird prototype, I think. I don't know. But it's, yeah. it's, it's entertaining, otherwise it wouldn't work, but it, it's relatable. <laughs> but it's just weird.
You know, you look like you might be David Harbour under that beard. Are you David Harbour? Who's David Harbour? I need to look that up. On <laughs> okay. David Harbour is that actor from uh, Stranger Things, and uh, he just kind of gets a lot of work these days. Well, and I should say yes, because I need more. I could use, a, I could use the money. <laughs> David Harbour. Okay. No, my girlfriend watches that show. That, that kid's lisp on the fucking, um, the kid's lisp annoys me, so I don't watch that show. I want, I, it's like, I can't, I can't understand. Like, I hate the way he talks. Like, I don't mean in a mean way. I just, like, I don't hate him. I just, hate, I just don't want to watch the show. Right. Well, I would say on that, that that's another classic example of like very entertaining fun season one. And then they had no idea like what they were doing. Like they, they probably didn't know they had a hit. They probably didn't know. They're like, oh, shit, we got to yeah. try it out. Yeah. They're like, we're filming this kitty show. That's like a sort of spooky thing. It's nobody's going to care. And then it's the biggest show on TV. And they're like, oh, my God, we got to do more. <laughs> what do right. we do? The only way to recover from that is like do some lost shit where it doesn't make sense. That's like yeah. the only that's the only way Then everyone just pretend to get it because they don't want to look stupid. I know. I know. I never got into Lost, but the fa passionate fans of Lost always have that exact same story. They're like, it was great. It was terrible. It got great again. And then it was awful. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. It was always like my pretentious friends that pretended like I just didn't get it. Like, like, like man, you just don't get how, uh, <laughs> like, this that's, what, that's how they describe it. I'm like, okay, explain it to me. The hatch and the time. And the, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> people were obsessed with that show like that that and seinfeld like i like seinfeld but not as much as everybody else you know like everybody really like loves that show like the most almost yeah i mean i love that i was the perfect age and perfect like that's what i wanted to be as well like i i mean that I, makes a lot of sense you know i wanted to be the, the, uh, some version of that and i will agree in looking back and this happens with everything. This happened with disco, with anything you can think of that became popular and then way overwrought. Oh, like, yeah. like Seinfeld was great at the beginning when nobody watched it and nobody enjoyed it. And then in the middle, when people started watching, it was also great. So the audience kept building and building. But then by the time they had maximum audience and everybody was going nuts over every episode every week with yada, yada, yada and all that crap, like that's when the show was just not as good. So I feel like it's as it got bigger, it, it got worse. Whereas uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm, which I love, I feel like it's just been straight down the line. Hilarious for me. Well, it probably never peaked. And like in your example, that makes sense. Like because Curb Your Enthusiasm is kind of like, an, it's successful, but it's kind of like an underground show more so where Seinfeld is like super, super mainstream. Yeah. No one will ever watch in as big an audience as, as watch Seinfeld. Like not even, not the Super Bowl now probably gets one quarter what a what a, an average seinfeld got yeah that's weird that's that's a weird thing yeah i don't know how to describe this like i think like um the super bowl like, super bowl most institutions are like dead right now <laughs> like in america too so it's like a weird example too and like um i know seinfeld did a lot of shit and i respect it and stuff but i just feel like it's like um it's like citizen kane maybe or something it's like like in film school everybody tells you citizen kane's the best movie in the world but i mean it's just fucking outdated you know it's just like one of those things it's like it's like uh, for, i mean if i grew up in its prime I, I could probably relate to one of what you said and the same with like citizen kane i probably could have appreciated it when it came out and be like oh yeah they just like made fun of this like media mogul and this edgy but 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 i just feel like now i'm just like watching i'm like i just don't give a fuck about it man i just don't it's like uh it's so boring and i try to watch it but it's just like not even i mean butterfly effect is a better movie that movie's like okay you know what i mean <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like oh my god we would have such a long argument about this if we were in person but uh, I, I, the, I, the butterfly effect i mean come on you, you can't close with that like that the butterfly effect i happen to have seen as well that's ashton kutcher right yeah 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 yeah, yeah. and it was a, I, I i see movies like that like the butterfly effect like you remember like the lake house with keanu reeves yeah 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 where there was like a magic mailbox that like went through time like i love that kind of shit so I, i'm all in on the idea but the idea that the butterfly effect was better than Citizen Kane, you should make that as like a banner headline. <laughs> it would piss off every film nerd in the world. But it's like, <laughs> but it's like, like even, even like, and the butterfly effect is like an okay movie, but I feel like it was still like, like now, if you compare them side to side, I'd rather watch the butterfly effect than Citizen Kane you, at this point. You'd rather watch like uh, Source Code with Jake Gyllenhaal. <laughs> <laughs> like that's your, that's more your jam. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen uh, Permanent Midnight with, uh, uh, with uh, Ben Stiller? Yeah. I wondered as a writer, you might have saw that. That's another example of like one of his lesser known movies, but probably his best movie. I love that. Yeah, I love it. that. You're, you're totally right. Great, uh, great performance uh, by him. And what a, what a very cool movie. Uh, yeah, I love that.
Yeah, in every other movie, he plays one of two characters. He plays like an awkward nerd, or he plays like the guy who's just like, yeah, God, oh, yeah. You know, just like, he has like two characters. And then uh, Permanent Midnight, he actually, I felt like he played the Alf Rider, but really well. Right, right. Yeah, which is no, interesting. He, he, he's good. That was, <laughs> it's just so funny how like dark that movie was for like just the guy that wrote Alf. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> like he thought it was like William S. Burroughs or some shit. It was just funny. Like, I know, that's hilarious. And they, <laughs> yeah, what he was cranking out was like just the, the most treacly Hollywood tame thing. Yeah, he's just doing drugs all the time. He wasn't mm-hmm. even writing, I feel like. That's what, like I, 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 no one will get that reference, and no one's ever fucking heard that movie besides us, probably, and Ben Stiller. Like, I, I <laughs> like anybody watching this, like, I have no idea what the fuck. No, you, ca- you catch a lot of people in their 40s if they listen. They'll, they'll know it. I feel like that, that's, a, that's one of those titles that people remember, and they remember that with the sort of shot of him like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> going nuts at the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so true. Like, I was, I was such a weird movie, man. I think I had the luckiest life in the world and still fucked it up constantly. What, uh, what is your favorite movie of all time? Oh, man, that's hard. If you ask me as a teenager, I'd say like Clockwork Orange, but I don't, know, I don't even know as an adult, really. I don't, I, I don't even... Clockwork I, is, I, Clockwork's cool. Yeah, I'd say that as a kid. That was probably my favorite movie like, in like high school and stuff when I yeah. felt like I had one. What about you? Uh, Raiders. Oh, that's classic. No, I love... Yeah, those are good movies, too. Yeah, but just... just I mean, I, I like... You know the first three, but the the first one I think is my favorite movie of all time. I, I love it. Lucas had that gift to make things epic. Like he he literally just made like like things of like. So I don't even really like Star Wars, but I can see that he still made it epic. You know, it's like. But I do like Raider. I like I like um I like um the Indiana Jones series quite a bit. My favorite yeah. trilogy is probably either like um it's probably Back to the Future is my favorite trilogy though. I'd say like I oh. I loved it. I loved it all the way through. And people give me shit about the third one. They're like the third one sucked. I'm like I don't give a fuck. What do you think? And he's like you know we have to agree. Do you want? It? It's so funny. I feel like opinion has shifted over the years uh, on the suckiness of the sequels because obviously like Back to the Future is in my top five movies ever. I mean like I it's so the perfect you know, movie trilogy. It's been talked about enough. It's fantastic. Back to the Future two for me was a huge disappointment like because I love the first one so much I went to the second one on opening day I remember with my dad and uh we just both walked out of there like what the fuck like it was so I didn't love it and then the third one uh I enjoyed like it kind of went back up for me not all the way not even close to the original but it was somewhere in between the third one just felt like oh that was nice that was sweet I liked it you know there were some cool sequences so you, yeah, you you and Crispin Glover hated the second one, probably. I guess, yeah. <laughs> I, I had the guy, I had the guy that played uh, George McFly in the second and third one on 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 here, and he told me this story about that. And that was just fucking crazy. Have you heard that? Well, I I knew that he was replaced, uh, but I have not heard anything about it. No, what happened? Yeah, Je- uh, Jeffrey Weisman was in, on one of these past episodes, and he, he basically um he played like a stunt double for him. Basically, I found out by talking to him. I didn't know that prior. Uh, so Crispin Glover went crazy. He he was asking for as much money as Michael J. Fox and stuff, and then he went on that Letterman thing, like supposedly on acid, like bragging about himself in like newspaper clips and shit. He's, he's like, I'm just awesome. I'm like strong, and I'm like I can kick. And he's like, he kicked like this close to Letterman's face. Yeah, that I and, remember. And a bunch of just crazy shit. And then they just didn't want to deal with him, so they replaced him with a with like a uh, a makeup double, basically. Because I mean, the second one, he's hanging upside down. You yeah, know I mean? so yeah, he, I remember that. It was his hair. Um, yeah. Yeah, that was what a what a weird contrivance to to. I mean, it really he really fucked that movie. Yeah, because he was uh, he's listen. Michael J. Fox is like you know his performance in Back to the Future. Is, it's just burned in my every take is burned in my brain because he's so great. But could say the same thing for Crispin Glover. He's amazing. Like he was. From the for the minute he's the old dad laughing at the reruns, eating the peanut brittle, you're just like, this guy's the best. Yeah, that's great. He thought so too, I think. Yeah, yeah, sad. <laughs> he, he would agree with you. No, it's, but no, it's, I, that's his just a crazy... Dad was, his dad was a weird Hollywood actor too, Crispin Glover's dad. Uh, I didn't know that. His name is Julian Glover, I think. He's got a very, in, like, like Crispin, he has a very distinct, interesting face. And he was in, I think he was in a Bond movie as one of the villains. He was in, Whoa. like, he was in a uh, Chinatown. He was, okay. like, one of uh, Jack Nicholson's assistants' uh, detectives. That's crazy. I didn't know yeah. his dad was in, in there, too. Yeah, Hollywood royalty. 
<laughs> I hear stories about. I don't know how accurate these stories are, but like um, like I was in I was in some movie like on Amazon, and like the one of the actresses' friends was telling me that basically um, Crispin Glover had some girl like locked in a castle for like some like some period of time. Like, like he's like, yeah, you want to come to my castle or whatever? And then she was like, said yes apparently for some reason, and then he just like hung out with her there for a little bit, and then like left her there for like a month or something. Oh my god! <laughs> I don't know how real that is, but I mean it was a story at least. You know? I believe it. I believe I, it. I do too. I just don't want to get sued, you know. So I'm saying I don't know if it's real or not. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Dude, uh, do you want to do you want to throw out any like links or anything people should look up about you before we get out of here, man? Like, uh, I mean, clearly. Oh well, no, you questions. know, I mean, just keep watching Family Guy and uh, check me out on Instagram. And soon I'll have uh, this podcast called A Typical Disgusting Display with Goldie and the Sulk. It'll be you know available wherever the hell you get podcasts. That's what we're trying to figure out. This episode is brought to you by Ghost Hunt. It is a spicy honey by Heart Soul Heat. So HeartSoulHeat.com. Uh, spicy honey is great on ice cream, ribs, fried chicken, pizza, and cheese plates. 100% made in America. Go to HeartSoulHeat.com and get some. This episode is sponsored by the Coldest Water. The coldest Water are these awesome uh, insulated water bottles that uh, can stay cold for days. Um, ice cold, so um, like in the picture, if you're watching this video, um, if you're listening to it, then you know what I'm talking about. Go to coldestwater.com, use promo code ROGERS, one, one word, let into the number one. Uh, go there, the discount is awesome bottle.